and welcome to Classical Schmassical, the anti-classical classical music podcast. Tune in every Saturday, every being a loose term, as we discuss, deconstruct, and dissect what it means to be a musician in the modern world. I'm your host, Alex Letourneau. I use any pronouns you like, and our guest this week is Emil Pandolfi. Good morning or good afternoon. How are you doing? Doing really well, yeah. How are you doing? Great, thank you, and thank you for having me on the show, Alexa. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I wonder, just so we can get a little bit uh, to know you a bit more um, before we get into the real meat of our conversation, if you can um, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about uh, what you, what it is you do and, and how you got to what you're doing. Okay, okay. Um, I'm My name is Emil Pandolfi, and I am a pianist. I do piano arrangements of uh, musicals and movie themes, and I've been doing that for about the last uh, 30 years or so. <clears throat> Pardon me. I've recorded about 30 albums, and of, of that of my arrangements of those uh, that type of that genre, and I'm uh, classically trained, as I think we all should be. Uh, no matter what you go into, that classical background is a is a, a must. So uh, I did that years ago and and uh, i've enjoyed a happy successful career i, I play concerts about uh, norm, in a normal year about uh, 20 or 30 a year uh just of myself and i have a guest singer amazing yeah thank you so much um and and you're coming on the podcast is actually really perfectly timed i would say uh given that your new book play it like you mean it uh just launched which huge huge congratulations on that um and I was wondering Thank if you, you can start with a little bit of an overview as to what that's about. I know I've been reading it and it's it's such a joy. It's very kind of you. The book is about putting more of your personality into your playing. I, I have always, I think part of uh, being Italian is that uh, you overdo emotional things. And right. in my play, I've always had the ability to put my emotion into whatever it is I'm playing, whether it be classical or pop. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to communicate that to others. I've never been a teacher by profession, but I have 40 years of experience in the uh, commercial music field as a profession. And I've had a very happy life doing it. So after all this time, I thought, you know, I, the only way to share it with a lot of people is to write it down in a book. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I grew up in a musical family. Uh, and uh, three out of four kids uh, became professional musicians. Oh, amazing. Yeah, so two two sisters are violinists and they, they, uh, one sister does more classical, the other has a jazz band. And um, so it's been part of our, of, the, of, of just what we do ever since I can remember. Yeah. And so I'm curious with with that sort of being ingrained in your your whole musical life, your whole life, really, um, with that kind of emotional connection. Um, I definitely hear that when listening to recordings. Um, and it is maybe something that I think a lot of like classically trained musicians struggle with. So is there like how, how do you approach that? Um, when when talking about it, since it is something that you grew up with and is very intrinsic, how do you integrate it or how do you quantify that and and how is it part of your artistic identity as you like i guess share that with others if that makes sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, th and that is uh that's what the book is all about and i'll give you uh, uh, my 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 best um uh, analogy is the spoken word because for example if i say uh we had a great day yesterday we stayed at the beach and we had the water was beautiful or i say we had the best day at the beach. We stayed there all day long. The hours just fl floated by and the water was perfect and everything was beautiful. And the difference, it, we're saying the same fact, but we're saying it with the emotional content that we, and the inflection really, inflection that we put into our spoken word. And most people, when they speak, if they're excited about what they're talking about, they're speaking to a close friend, they will do that. They will add their own, uh, personality into their spoken word and then sometimes when they get to the piano it's it's as though it's, it is a different language but it's a language of emotion i think um uh that is what invites the listener to pay attention and then you need to hold his attention by giving him something worthwhile to to uh, pay attention to and i uh, my mantra is why give a lukewarm performance 
you just mm. um, do everything bigger than life, you know? Yeah. In, in music, even if it's subtle, there's a there's a chapter there you may have seen. It's called "Bang Out the Subtleties," yeah. and it's facetious, of course. But if you're going to draw attention to something, an inner voice movement or something that is very uh, that otherwise would go unnoticed, you draw attention to it. Do that. You know, it's, yeah. it's bigger than life. So that's that's my view overall. Yeah, I think that that's a really amazing way of looking at it. I know, like. I, I'm somebody who really just sort of in my in my pastime, I enjoy learning about different languages, different spoken languages or, or signed languages or um, that kind of non, I guess, non non artistically based language in a linguistic sense. And and that is something that I think is, is such a part of learning that language is the inflection and getting those little the, and like knowing what the filler where it's like German is, is probably the best second language that I have. And like knowing to say M instead of um is like it's a huge it's a huge part of the language, even if though it's not something that's like officially in the classroom, you wouldn't learn what your um word is or how you can phrase that sentence. So it makes the most sense. And and I, I think that's a, that's a really lovely analogy um, and one that I personally find super helpful. Well, what you just said was I never thought of it, it, because I, I don't have a foreign language. I have a little bit of this and that, but uh, but it's true. I, I hadn't thought of the the uh, yeah the, those subtleties that are part of the maybe we say you know you know and somebody else says something entirely different in a different language. It's I guess music is my second language, and I'm sure. so familiar with that if I if I think it, I can express it on the piano pretty much. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, so kind of talking about a little bit of like what is and is not taught formally, I guess, um, kind of building off of that. I really love the idea of, of looking at what isn't taught in the music school and filling in the gaps, um, which I feel like you, you do really well. Uh, so can you give like examples of things that are that sort of oversight within this conservatoire system um, that you that you address or, or talk about? Mm hmm. So while I have had a, uh, a classical background and I love that I did, I think that whether it be classical or otherwise, you're telling a story and you really need to, you need to make it bigger than life in order to get that story across a distance. It's like when you're, if you're a public speaker and you are uh, speaking on a stage without a microphone, you need to speak more clearly and more slowly. I had to learn that myself. Uh, when I would watch videos back, I would think I, I was not aware I was speaking so fast. Mm -hmm. But but you you either can study that or you study your own videos and you work it out. The um, the thing is, bigger than life works in a piece of artwork, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, if you were in a museum looking at uh, famous paintings, the curator will point out to you some of the uh, subtleties in the painting that otherwise you would miss entirely. Well, the listener is no different. They don't know the piece of music you're playing, or they don't know that arrangement of it, or they're hearing it even for the hundredth time, but you're doing it a little bit differently your way. So you need to emphasize and draw attention to the little special gems that you put into that arrangement that's one of the yeah. most fun things about arranging yeah i really love that and one of the things that really stands out to me uh that kind of separates music from other art forms is how alive it is whereas like with like you were saying with visual art we having those sort of like interpreters and docents and volunteers who can guide you through what what maybe the the intent was or what is potentially being portrayed is really helpful but at the same time like the piece of art is not really changing versus with with music you know outside of electronic music it's never going to be exactly the same it's constantly changing and it's constantly evolving and that that malleability is really something that like i i appreciate especially when thinking about arranging and playing with emotion and there there is just so much room to to adapt to any situation, you give it, even with the same piece of music that you've played hundreds and thousands of times, it's 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 a really wonderful um, analogy, I think. Yeah. 
it's it's great. It, that's the fun thing about performing music is that um, even when I do an arrangement that I, I have really worked out carefully, I do it basically the same way, but naturally, every time I play it in a performing situation, the performance space is different. It might be uh, larger, it might be a little more intimate. Uh, a fortissimo in a mezzo forte environment is different from one in a pianissimo environment. Uh, sure. I mean, a sforzando. Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah, an accent is an accent, but it's an accent within its environment. So uh, I, you naturally wouldn't play I, sometimes I've been in a room where I don't have the lid up. I have it on the short stick because the room is just too small and the piano is mm -hmm. that big. Right. And those adjustments on the fly. Um, it, it is a living, breathing uh, art form. Yeah. Uh, we, which is different from the, the amazing sculptures that we see and amazing paintings. Right. And they're there forever. Thank goodness. It's wonderful. But they're done. And the artist is not involved once he's done yeah you, you and I are involved every single time we do it yeah and I, I think about that a lot as a composer too because in in some ways it's sort of like I'm the sculptor when I finish something the product is finished but my my the, the product that I'm doing I don't I have a complicated relationship with with how I view my art but in, in some way, it's not really art. It is things that are on a page. I've, I've printed it out and I say, here you go. And then I, I have to put that trust in a performer to really mm. take this. I basically write an instruction manual and then you, you go there and then the, the performers that I, that I trust will then make the art out of, out of my instructions. And it's, it's a really, it's a really fascinating, I don't know, it's a fascinating topic. And I yeah. I know a lot of people like will laugh at music. Uh, my friends will laugh at musicians in general because they'll be like, "Well, you've had you'll discuss for hours what an unmarked quarter note. How long do you play that?" And I'm like, yeah, because it's different every time, and it's really interesting, and it sounds so pedantic, but it really is. It's it's amazing how much adaptability there is. And and it's true. You need to know those. Um... Those absolutes. And you need, I mean, you need to know, learn those early on in your education. And as we all have, we all know this, but sometimes it's hard to do, is to shed some of those fixed ideas and some of that. The discussion can become an intellectual delight, a pastime. It's wonderful. How long is, is it? You know, what, when should you play a mordant or a turn? Oh, I mean, right. that's fun to, to talk about. But in the end, it's just like your vocabulary. The more books you read, the more. Uh, the more that you write and speak, the better you are with the language. Yeah. And the, the, the language of music is no different. The more you know, the more you have at your fingertips. And, and then it disappears. And you just say what you're saying when you're composing or when you're um, performing. It's, it's, it's brilliant that we can do that in real time over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's so collaborative too. Like I I don't know. I love playing, I love playing new music, but I also really love playing old music, especially when it just it feels like I'm getting to collaborate with someone who I could never have have collaborated with, if you know if this this kind of art didn't exist. Where I have this set of instructions to to do to interpret to make my own, and it's like I get to collaborate with. You know Bach, who died in 1750. I can, we can still, we can still work together, and it's, it's really, I don't know, it's very magical the way it kind of time travels. From maybe that's a very like idealistic way to view it, but it, I think it is really interesting. I think it's a very realistic way. I, the fact that I've never heard it put that way that it's, it's like an instru instruction manual or an ins or set of instructions, and giving it over to somebody else, you're trusting them to here's there's this gift i'm trusting you to do something wonderful with it I, because i have never written music i've written a few songs here and there but sure. i'm what i do is arrange but uh i've never written something and then handed it over to somebody to to see what they would do with it but i would imagine it would be a delight to see what they do with it and what the next person does yeah i, I that, that must be wonderful. It really is. And one of, the, one of the biggest things that I have found in my compositional education is when I will give, a, give somebody a piece of music and I always ask for it back once they're done with it because seeing the marks that they made in the music, you oh. know, where you're circling a dynamic or you're adding in a little crescendo or anything like that, 
it's it's a mm -hmm. huge uh, it's such a joy to see what did you take out of this and what did you mark in that maybe i maybe i should mark in or maybe it was something that that you've injected yourself into the music and i i love that i love that relationship that, that must be very satisfying it really really yeah. is um yeah. So yeah, I, I'm also, I know that your book is also a little bit about kind of getting started in the music business, which I think is something on a lot of people's minds uh, right now, especially like college, graduate school age, uh, which is most of my musical connections are around there. Um, so I, kind of in, in, in no uncertain terms, do you think that with the current system that artists and musicians especially are prepared to make a living and what are what's your take on like what should we include in like an entrepreneurship curriculum or ways that we can monetize our work without compromising that artistic uh, integrity or or voice or vision yeah so first of all when I started, the the whole uh, structure of business was entirely different. My biggest thing would be, you've got to keep running, running as fast as you can and keep up with what is current. We've been independent ever since 40 years ago, when there was no internet happening in any big way. And uh, we, we, were, we were doing hard copies of pr promotional materials and a mailing list was, we had a something like a 13,000 people on a mailing list at one point, but we were mailing them hard copies. It was incredibly expensive. A newsletter once, uh, excuse me, about three times a year, things like that. But m the biggest thing I would say was, is, is um, there is tons and tons of information that is free uh, on the on the internet nowadays. That And we keep looking at it because we're, when, when, um, when streaming first became available with Apple Music, I forget how many years ago, we got onto it. It was very complex to get onto it at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Apple Music was, I think, was the first one. Uh, we got on there within the first couple of years that it was available because we, I say we, it's my wife Judy was doing the business end of things, and uh, and she just, she just, she started she, she by just reading books on the business of music, but I guess my whole thing is that it's it's much easier to do now but you have to there's no there's no ladder there's no corporate yeah. ladder there's no structure for it you i think each person has to invent his own but i can tell you right now even this far into my career and we're we're successful we're you know established but i spend way more way more time at the computer than i do at the piano and i hate that mm -hmm. but it's just one of the and i wish i had known that earlier on that music is a business like any other business and every business you know whether it be lawyers or doctors or or a, a construction company they spend a 40-hour week somebody does doing the business of that business they're yeah. not during the construction you're not out there building houses every day somebody if it's not you is working a 40-hour week and my, i guess my message here is if you're like me as an artist, you kind of object to that. Well, music is a business, and 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 the good news is that it's all doable. I've done it. A lot of people have done it, and it's easier. It's I think what I know about is commercial music, so I can't speak for the uh, uh, the the classical tradition in music. I think I think the music schools and uh, uh, concert concert circuits like that. I have never been in that, so so I can't speak to that. Mm -hmm. But it's much easier to make a living as commercial music because it's what what the kind of music that I'm in, commercial music in general, has a vastly larger audience, mm -hmm. which means there are vastly more opportunities to, to do it. And the good news about having a starting a career in it is you can have your day job. Let's call it a day job, because most musical jobs are at night, mm -hmm. and you can have you know, plenty of people keep doing jobs particularly when you're young and uh, particularly when you're single and if you can if you can move around um i i, I did some uh, things that i mentioned in the book is even if you have a day job that you hate you can find a day job that you can hate in in the french riviera you know you can mm -hmm. hate a job in, yeah. at the beach or the mountains or wherever you're, you happen to be your special place that you love to go i had a 
I had a day job, which was uh, working in a jewelry store in the Caribbean. I lived for two years in the in paradise when yeah. I was quite young. And why not? And meantime, I, I, I got some jobs playing at night here and there. I was able to move it along to entirely music after a few years. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that I, I lived in Los Angeles. It was exciting to be in Los Angeles. I at the comedy store. Uh, it was, I was making almost no money at all, but I was... I was learning about comedy and I was seeing actors and actresses and I, they had opportunities to play for acting class or vocal coaches, all sorts of things. So I guess the thing is you have to get that you're going to have to spend a whole heck of a lot of time. You look how many hours a day you spent learning your craft or you're going to have to spend at least a tenth of that time doing the business of it. It's just like in the book I say at one point, in order to create great art, you have to know how to, and that's the technique. Well, in order to create a great business, you have to know how to. Yeah. You don't just, it doesn't just happen. So it, it's, uh, but it, it's, it's all doable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. How is, how is the relationship between like your classical training into like the commercial music scene? How does that, um, like, how are those two related and how do they kind of impact your artistic, I don't know, identity or self or voice or whatever you want to call it? Um, I wonder, I'm wondering, curious as to how those things kind of interact with each other. Uh, absolutely brilliantly. I, I had, um, I, I uh, went to school uh, like we all did music school. We got to, uh, I, I, I think I mentioned to you earlier, I, I was within three months of a master's degree and I decided to quit school. So I quit, but I had had all those years of training, classical training, and I put it to use every arrangement. I, I don't think, oh, I learned this when I learned the Chopin Ballade, but I, I can't help it. It's in the, it's part of my thinking process that mm. embellishments from, from Chopin power and strength from Rachmaninoff uh, impressionistic kind of, um, the diaphanous sounds from Debussy. Those are my three uh, most influential to me when I'm writing. And I don't think back what would Debussy do, but I find myself doing what I think Debussy might have done. Uh, not not to be a shadow of Debussy, but because I learned so much from him. It's like if you read chart, if you read everything that Charles Dickens wrote, and then you wrote a novel, you might find yourself doing some of those things because it's, mm -hmm. it's just part of your thinking uh, using some of those phrases. So, uh, so it, the, the answer to the question is that the classical training is indelible, indelibly married to my arrangements and my arrangements uh, have, have gotten a lot of listening because they're unusual and they actually, they actually take you, to, they take you to place. I have a knack for, for, getting an emotional bubble around the story that is presented in the music. That's why I love doing musicals or old standards that have great lyrics, because mm -hmm. I, I learn the lyrics and then I try to tell that story. And the tools I, I have to tell the story with, I got from classical training. Yeah. That's kind of it. Yeah, that's lovely. I, I feel like I... Uh... I hear a lot of people worried about like, well, they're, they're they're in school for classical now and they're worried about like selling out to try and avoid this like starving artist stereotype. Um, but it's really it's really lovely to hear that the two can interact in such a productive and I think like very symbiotic way. Well, you know, I think if you if you do think playing pop music is selling out, then you shouldn't do it. You should go classical sure. no matter yeah. what. <laughs> I never, I always, I have always felt that I would see it's, it's, um, I always wanted to play music for other people and for other people, I mean, not just trained musicians, although I love, love to play for trained musicians. They hear the, the, all the cool things you did, you know? Yeah. But, um, play for just an audience of listeners that, that is my favorite thing to do. So mm -hmm. this audience wants to hear these tunes and, and honestly, I can say, I have maintained my artistic viewpoint in the uh, in the arrangements that I made because if I if I don't sometimes I'm asked to play a, a, a particular song that I just hate, but I have to play it for an event or something. Sure. I will I'll do my best that I can with it, but then I don't record it. Anything I've recorded, I actually believe in, mm -hmm. and 
love the, the uh, movie themes. I love some of the songs from the yeah. musicals. And, um, and I have the luxury of just playing what I want to play in my show. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just me, so I can choose my program. Yeah. And choose accordingly. But it's in no way do I feel compromised with my integrity. Yeah, I love that. And like for me, it's, I, I talk about like thinking with my performer brain and my composer brain and all this, but like for me, genre is is something that is important only when I'm thinking with my listener brain. It's very, it's lovely because I'll want to hear a certain genre of music or, oh, I'm in a pop mood or I'm in a classical mood, but as a mood, but as a performer, I just kind of like play what I enjoy and I play, I, I love the relationship that I have with a listener when I'm performing. And so I play what they want to, what, what they want to hear. And I, I think it kind of goes back to that collaboration again, but yeah, I, I think that's really wonderful. Well, I know I, I, uh, when I'm writing an arrangement, I'm thinking as a listener, because there's, there's some things, some classical pieces and some of my arrangements that I just love, but my wife is a good example, a good ear for me because she's completely not trained in music mm. and she listens to popular music all her life. She knows a little bit classical. And if she doesn't like it, that's a pretty good index that here, here's the thing that you might appreciate. You and I know how complex or how difficult this piece of music might have been to, to write or, or to perform. The average listener has no idea. They like it or they don't sure. like it. I've played are technically really demanding and I, and I say to my wife or my friends and they say well that's that's very nice and I think but it doesn't get in the good to be in the show it gets to be on I do that on my time yeah yeah because, because uh, I try to be a listener who's the kind of listener is going to be listening to my stuff yeah I love that um so also relating to kind of that getting getting career starting idea um, what are some ways that you found to fight sort of like burnouts or maintaining uh, or re even regaining inspiration in your artistic practice, especially within this kind of like cutthroat conservatory setting and this business world? And how, how do you maintain that kind of musical inspiration throughout that? Uh, that's it's actually easy for me to do because uh, because I what I will do is I'll go, uh, uh, I'll look up on YouTube some of my favorite artists. So it could be Pavarotti, it could be Yo-Yo Ma, uh, any number of artists that I really, really love to hear. I'll look at paintings that I love. I, I go to, I read a, uh, you know, read part of a book I, uh, by an author that I love. I think other art forms, not for the purpose of getting inspired, but it, and you end up getting inspired. You say, oh my gosh. Now, you know, every now and then you see uh, a six-year-old who can play the fantasy impromptu. And, you... <laughs> sure. and I turn that off. I, turn that... Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. But sure. hopefully you choose. But normally seeing, I, I, I'm, I mean, uh, Cirque du Soleil, acrobats, people doing extraordinary things. That is what gets my, I think I've got to get to the piano and work this thing out. Because usually when you hit the doldrums is because you were trying, you were, got so funneled, focused into some project mm -hmm. that done, I think when you, you can overdo something, you're, you're practicing it so long that you're now, I don't know why it happens, but it happens. I sometimes I have to walk away from this difficult passage and leave it for a couple of days. And two days later, it fixed itself somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not a biologist, but it happens. If it works, standing on one foot, playing with one finger, that's fine with me. I, it, it's just what works, works. Mm -hmm. And I know, I think for almost anybody, if you start looking at art of all kinds that you admire or listening to, music that has nothing to do with your music how could you not get re-inspired I don't I don't I don't know because I've never had that mm -hmm. that issue yeah I mean I one of the things that I really love I've never made this connection before but I love writing uh vocal music and I'm, I'm like starting work on my first opera and I have a wonderful librettist friend who like we met because we he did slam poetry in in college and i like went to his shows because i wanted to be a, be supportive and it's 
it's such a joy to write vocal music because by definition I'm engaging with poetry that I love because his his work is stunning and I read any of it and I go this is so cool this is beautiful this expresses something that I didn't even know I was feeling and it's wrapped up in the compositional process and so I, I really agree with that like engaging with with other arts thing I think that is something that I never realized how much it does help me but just in that example it, it is it's one of my favorite things to do. Oh, that's great. That's exciting. An opera. Whoa. Oh, yeah. Big deal. <laughs> it is a big deal. When I say right, like, we have done all of the planning work, and now, like, the next step is to actually, like, write it. And it's like, oh, well, the planning work was fun, and this is scary now. <laughs> uh, you know, when I think back to uh, all the great composers, and right now I was thinking of Puccini and Verdi, they did have to write them by hand. And <laughs> I know they had copyists and all the parts, but oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. I mean, we can type it in if we have to and we'll get somebody to transcribe it for us. And the and, and also ink, no pencils back in Beethoven's time. It's just yeah. beyond me. Yeah. The whole there's, symphony. There's a couple of um, composition teachers that I've that I've had or, or engaged with who who still absolutely swear by writing by hand and i like it as an exercise but wow it's so much work to to sit with a pen and pen or pen or a pencil and some staff paper and say i'm gonna write now and especially i'm i'm so so terrible at piano and so i'll sit at the piano to do that and then it's it's i'm hitting all kinds of of notes that are uh, well, I guess in the compositional process, more unexpected than wrong notes, but it's 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 quite a process for me. <laughs> Sometimes some of those unexpected notes yield fruit that you didn't think of. Yes, you... yes. Or it pulls us into another genre. The amount of accidental jazz chords. <laughs> That's right. Really, really That's fun. Great. Yeah, so as we're just about getting ready to wrap up, I'm wondering... Um, do you have sort of just closing advice for musicians and artists in general, sort of at the beginning of their careers or young professionals within today's global climate with all of the competition with everything going on? Um, yeah. Yes, I do. I, I think, I think a couple of things. First of all, if that, if you have to ask yourself, do I really want a career in music? And I'm, I'm not being facetious or anything else here. Do I really want one? Because if you do, then there are steps that we'll talk, we'll talk about and there's all kinds of information. But you might find out that you want music as a phenomenal pastime and you want to have a career as something else that makes you money and pays the rent and makes maybe if you want to make lots of money, maybe music's not the way to go. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But the, the advice that I would say is if you're starting out, if you're young and you're starting out with the wanting music, you don't think of the, the thousands of music, musicians out there and I'm one of them. Think I'm one person who needs one job. When I was, I, as I've always worked solo, so I wasn't, I've been in a few bands, but mostly solo. So when I would go to a new place, which I did, I moved around a lot when I was uh, younger. And I would just show up at a, at a new town, Denver, or uh, Sussex, England, I lived for two years. Virgin Islands, I lived for a couple of years. I uh, lived in Los Angeles. I would, I would show up without a job, and, and then I'd say, there's got to be one job for a cocktail pianist. And if there is, I'll get it. Not even if there is. I know there is. And it has never, ever failed me. Uh, I, I showed up. The, Greenville, South Carolina, what, all those years ago, was where would a cocktail pianist work in this little southern town thinking 40 years ago? Um, well, there was one place and I got it. And yeah. uh, it's, that's been my philosophy. I'm not, I'm not worried about trends or can you make a living in music or starving artists or anything else. I'm just thinking in that case, very selfishly about me and my next step. And it's that whole thing about the uh, journey of a thousand miles, the first step, all that. Well, yeah, it's true. And there's nothing, there's no, some, some musicians 
feel like if I get a day job, I'm giving up on my dream. No, you're not. You're supporting your dream. That's just, you're doing whatever it takes to, to fulfill your dream. And plenty of people work two jobs all their lives, you know? So you can certainly work two jobs. And, 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 and once the rent is out of the way, you have the time that you do spend at the piano or at your instrument. Oh my God, what a relief. I don't have to worry about paying rent. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, uh, and, and there are plenty of people, particularly nowadays, just broadcast widely. There are plenty of people making a good living as musicians, plenty, plenty, plenty. And, and one of my, uh, it's not, a, it was, it was an, uh, stated in one of the chapters in Play Like You Mean It was how, how to be very successful without ever being famous. And mm. that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm the, not famous, but I'm making a very good living. I'm very happy, very fulfilled life. I have, you know, and you've got to concentrate on how easy it is instead of how difficult. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Person, yeah, well, good. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I, I feel like I hear a lot that like, oh, well, the the, it's so saturated with so many people and and, oh my gosh, it's so hard now. But like, I I love that idea of just like, I I, just just one job will do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it feel, feels a lot less stressful than thinking about, uh, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of, of other people compete. It's, yeah. I, yeah, I like that. The other uh, salient point is don't think getting a day job is like you're embarrassed I have a day job. No, you should be proud of yourself for yeah. taking care of business because, again, music is a business like anything else. And if you have to do something else to support that business well that's what you have to do yeah. and eventually you won't have to i did that. i was a janitor i was a i when i lived in an apartment in my 20s i did maintenance around the apartment to help pay the rent because i didn't i wasn't making diddly i was a you know i was playing occasionally playing piano here and there and i didn't have a quote day job until i got until uh, i became a janitor and and I enjoyed the janitoring because it paid my rent. I was yeah. just thrilled. <laughs> and, yeah. and a lot of people become waiters and waitresses or or a, a clerk at a counter or something. Why not? Yeah. And and always remember, you can be a janitor in Hilton Head Island in South Carolina, or or, or the or in uh, some exotic place where you want to go. Alaska is part of the U.S. U.S. Virgin Islands are part of the U.S. Don't even need a work visa. Yeah. Just show up and get a job as something because they have jobs anywhere you go. And that job is there to support your dream until yeah. you can shed. So yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. I think and I think very, very relevant advice for, for the world in which we're living. And yeah, that's that's super, super helpful. I thank you so much. Um yeah, well, thank you. Thank you again to Emil for joining us here at Classical Schmassical. Uh, if you at home enjoyed the show, there is definitely more where that came from. So do make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Uh, definitely make sure to pick up a copy of his book, Play It Like You Mean It. I have been chugging on through reading it, and it's it's so well done and has already really helped me to reframe my artistic practice in a, in a very helpful way, uh, even as a non-pianist. Um, it's it's really really wonderful and also like very lighthearted and easy to digest uh and if you would like to continue the conversation or discuss his book join the discord linked in the description or visit our facebook page at facebook.com slash classical schmassical at schmassical s-c-h-m-a-s-s-i-c-a-l and remember stay classy and questionably classical uh-huh.